excellent defenses. The mind games on attack of the Capital, the Monty. What do you deal with? They just had an answer for BDS, and that's what I love seeing. Counter prep, counter analysis, adaptation, and G2 have brought it in spades today. Can I got for once on finish my point. You know what? Last time I tried to make that point, you know what he said? Il y a des gens qui jouent, qui sont là pour faire le spectacle. Il y en a qui sont là pour faire vivre le spectacle. I mean, that was just out and out slaughter. Once they started pushing towards the site, first attacking round they won. Rainbow We've Six Casters for me breathe the life into the professional one, game. They make the, the good plays broken, sound great. They, they can teach the new viewers the key aspects of competitive play, which is really important for the future of the game. And to me, casters are really important in Siege. They're the ones that bring the game to life. Without them, we just wouldn't be able to enjoy the game as much as we do. Single thing that they're trying to do. Look at that. They try to move into garage. Breeders waiting. Try to move through. Ça aide les gens à comprendre le jeu. Ça aide les gens à, à vouloir en savoir plus et à le vivre en fait, à vivre le match comme nous on le vit. Parce que nous, quand on le vit, on le vit intensément. Et on peut pas vivre Rainbow Six Siege si on ne le comprend pas. I used to teach at a university. I was a criminologist before esports, so I used to teach criminology at a university, and I get to use a lot of my, you know, previous knowledge inside this job as well. So my job's very different from what I used to do, which was just talking over the game. Now I have to essentially head all of the analytical breakdown from start to finish. Yeah. Our job is always going to be the translators of the game, because we all have our own sort of separate roles in what we bring, whether it's a play-by-play -play caster like I am, or an analyst um, on the desk, or a color caster, which is the sort of amalgamation of both. I'm the host of EU League and APAC North League. My job as a host is different than that of a caster. I've gone through caster, analyst, host, any position that you want in Rainbow Six and other esports. But the distinction for me as a host is mostly what is the story that I'm trying to tell the viewers and through my analysts. We are working behind the scenes, so, so our role is, is to show the best in-game footage. But all the casters are the faces of Rainbow Six Siege. So um, if they have a good bond with certain teams or, or fans or, or the game as a whole, it creates this, this great story uh, that everyone feels involved with, with Siege as a game. And we just help to show the game uh, the best way we can. Just Des, thanks so very much for that. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to kick it off between our two CIS giants. It's Navi, it's Virtus Pro, and on the cast await us, it's Hap and M. To understand Enjoy that my hard. position as a host is Thank to make sure that the CIS. analysts shine. Their job is to explain everything in a concise way, and I'm here to moderate the conversation and make sure that I'm constantly in contact with production and knowing how do I time everything, who is saying what, how can I ask a question because of my own game knowledge to say this question is a hard hitter. Analysts will have to scrub their brains to find an answer for this question and it's relevant to what yes, we're well, doing. Mother. Welcome back. I'm Milos. This is Des. This is Jess. We're going to have a chat about these two squads. Starting off with Virtus Pro and the team that is in Okay, that's now uh, BDS G2, big fight, the two big well, titans of Europe history. Yeah, I'm excited about that. G2 has played BDS in so many different rosters since, you know, the start of EUL. Defense only? Defensive win rate yeah. of 73. G2 BDS, big story between these two teams. Okay, these two orgs have played against one another so many times in EU. They're the top two European teams when it comes to also how famous they are within the region. So we need to focus on that. Last time they played, it was a really big game. That was the final of EU League. That was in January. I mentioned the funny story about that change. Remember at the start of stage one, um, how they were attacking secret on consulate and then they switched to defense and absolutely shattered the bed? Mm. That's the best one for me. 
It's a strange one because there's a lot of beef there, like a lot of history. Both teams were exceptionally talented. Then they started going, all the players have since grown up and they've sort of matured past all that stuff and it's way in the past now. Um, and now obviously Penguins retired and that team sort of, but it built a big storyline there. It built this big aspect of this other stuff happened and everybody knew about it. If you have a fine watch like BDS, you might be. Mm. They do have good fine watch. I think you got Citizen, you're asking for a bit of a bite in the backside. And he's been playing a lot of mozzie with the C4, so depending on the map, that could be dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people will say it's an old rivalry, uh, but as someone who used to, you know, work with one of the players, he used to be my player, uh, who's now moved on to G2, I think that's a straight out lie. Um, that is a brand new team. Anyone says it's an old rivalry doesn't understand the crux of what G2 has done by composing a team of almost brand new players. This new G2 team is different and they will go far if they can work out their attacks. And I think it will be the one of the teams that in the next six months will really truly battle against a team like BDS. No man's Villa Charlie, right? That's been BDS's most banned in the first two. The first two is usually Villa Charlie. See, they might just leave Charlie. And that's sort of what we build at the beginning of the day is we'll look at that sort of main point of like, okay, how can we boil down all of these other things and kind of get rid of the rubbish and go, this is what people are gonna go, oh, okay, I'll watch this. And then we try and make it cool. Because it's not that they're just so fantastic, they are a very good team, but it's their consistency that is the reason that they're the bar in a league where at the minute we're plagued by inconsistency. You always wanna focus in on a storyline because you never know how things are gonna go. Um, and you want to make sure every show day that you're sort of delivering the best, there's always nerves there and there's always that bit of a drive because you have no idea what's going to happen. So for me, the main thing is what is the story for the day. I'm working more behind the scenes with the production team to make sure that we have a day ready every single time. And like in the normal day, you're pulling up the matches for the day, you're seeing, okay, these two teams are playing against one another, what's the story for this one? Because you're trying to uh, convey the information to newcomers and to hardcore viewers at the same time. And as a host, you're just building that big story that is between them. A typical day for me is very different from a commentator, so I'll set up all of the different clips for the Telestrator machine, which will take a heck of a long time. I need to edit them myself. Then I need to do all of our statistical head-to-head, -head, so I'll garner all of our statistics. I'll go through them and I'll devise whether or not we need to do a statistical comparison. We have enough statistical or map, meta, coaching, support, staffing analysis for us to be able to talk. It's sort of said by a lot of casters of other games is, like, the Siege is the hardest one to get into because you don't just have to know all the operators, and you don't just have to know all the maps, which is what you do in any game, but you have to know like why people are doing things across multiple different floors. Because you can have a strategy that's like, these three are gonna be doing this at this point, and then this person's gonna be on the other side of the map doing something that anyone else would be like, why the hell is he over there? Why is he not helping the team? But then we're like, oh, he's doing this, so they can do this, and then that'll allow that, and then, and knowing that, and knowing that for every single different team and all the different flavors of every different region, you kind of, you have to love it to keep up with it, which lucky all of us do. If you ask that's back, there's an app that's really useful. Oh, what is your first name here? Is it that one? The EU is on the entire... Just try the website. Just try the website. There's one on the entire list. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time again for EU League. The first matchup is done between Empire and Secret. We head into our second. You see Navi versus Virtus Pro to the biggest. Dunn has been a priority for them. It has been a case of, right, let's get in there. The double gets dropped and there's two back in favor for Nath. Doesn't know about the man in elbow though. Again, they know the first obstacle here they need to deal with is that. Secretly talking of is entirely cut across there. The window over the foosball table is the one to drop. But look at Nath underneath, goes for the impact, tries to get the double drop there on Pasha, who survives, dug on a corner in Karzek, and he's able to pull his way to the half seat there. It's like a bit of a this for this game. Not for too long. Yeah, our job is basically uh, combining the image on screen with what the casters are telling. So um, we try to figure out what the teams are doing. We show that to the casters, they talk about it, or if they talk about something. The 
But ladies and gentlemen, it's G2 versus BDS, and I'm so excited for this one. On Clubhouse, we got Ace, we got Dez. Have fun. Still applying that burn stuff after Doki really scorched me on that last desk. Ah, it's all Jessie's going turn. off tonight, isn't it? <laughs> Jess is going to need some salve as well, because my god, she's in trouble backstage with me, life, that's for sure. However, there is a big game that waits before us. BDS G2, two iconic names here in Europe, and a showdown that everyone loves to see kick off, especially on a map as historic as Clubhouse. And there's folks behind him here, five seconds to go. It's now or never, boys. You've got to make the challenge happen. Shaiko with a 3k, five versus one. This could be yet another flawless round. Yes, it will. Someone stop BDS. They look phenomenal on defense. You can't, Des. You cannot stop BDS on defense. Coming in here, they have the highest defensive. And Heath, there we go. That's the spot they needed. Virtue, he's having a massive Why? round as he gets his third. And that is going to be two nades, one gun. And it is all that Virtue needs to deal death inside a clubhouse. I mean, three kills in the round is the sort of thing that should basically secure you a win here. But it's now about converting it. You've got Rafal and Bride, a two versus four and 30 seconds still to play for G2. The league, I mean, by that nerd, by that talk, and they have the highest attacking win rate as well, Des. Yeah. But BDS are very, very solid when it comes to the defensive side, and we're seeing that here. G2 return that. 24 seconds left to go. Renshiro holding down still oh from man. that cash side. The pings are coming in. Breeders is underneath, Des. I'm not sure they're aware they are. Virtue it is with another essential kill. Headshot Citizen finishes, and oh, that fire. is the round and the game for G2. But let's go over to the desk and get their breakdown on what has been a momentous game on Play Day 5. Thanks so very much, boys. And yes, what a game we had. We were all kind of on really good terms in private. At least in my opinion, we were like kind of a family and uh, we feel like it. We are all in uh, some kind of house, living as roommates and then going to work and do the broadcast. So like all the really good vibes among everyone all the time. Obviously, there's a lot of pain and difficulties for doing anything that you do. But through this job, through doing all of this, not only can I exercise my passion and my and learn a lot when it comes to online production and all of that, but I've met the love of my life through this game as well. So it is the perfect combination one could ask for. I think it's a big question to ask someone what inspires them or is their most, you know, passionate feeling of being in their job because not everyone has a passion for their job anymore, you know, they just go to work, they go home and I do world championships. I mean, if you have enough different flavours in your meal, you're going to enjoy it. But if you're waking up eating mashed potato every day, you probably get sick of the mashed potato every day. I think it's a bit different to everyone else's because I'm the sort of one of the only open LGBTQ people in esports in general. I was the first sort of trans caster in tier one. So I have a lot of eyes on me, um, which is nothing I ever expected. I'm here because I like video games and because I like making things. Um, and that was about four years ago. And it's kind of snowballed since then. It's gone from being something fun to do to being my job, which is a surprising story arc. I didn't know this was a job four years ago. I didn't know people got paid to do this four years ago. But here I am, so that's pretty cool. Show one being used, the evil eyes have been destroyed so early in every single round of the yokai's, even mid rotation or hidden under a surface somewhere, are still being sniffed out. It's almost like Emperor got everything thrown down and no steps that they need to do in the early round.